Hi, I'm Jared Gardner, and today we're going to be talking about Nevis sebaceus. And if you look up at the top to the title of this video, you'll notice that the word sebaceus does not have an O. That is not a typo, that's intentional. I don't remember or know, actually, maybe I never learned why this spelling is this way, but it's very important in the field of dermatology and derm path to remember not to add that extra O to Nevis sebaceus. So there are some quirky little things about dermatologic um, entities, and that's one of them, the spelling. So Nevis sebaceus, these usually present um, congenitally, they're on the, the scalp of kids most commonly, and they start as a little hairless um, uh, patch or plaque, and over time they tend to grow and get larger, and particularly as the patients get into puberty um, and the androgen hormones are circulating and make the sebaceous glands grow, the, the plaque will get larger, kind of warty looking, and get greasy and yellowy because of all of the sebaceous glands that are here. So that's the clinical um, scenario that you usually see, and here's what um, this was actually size to remove it for cosmetic reasons. And this is what Nevis sebaceus looks like. So the surface of the, uh, the epidermis is, is very abnormal. Look over here and remind yourself, this is what normal epidermis should look like. Okay. And as we go into the Nevis sebaceus, you can see one thing, the epidermis gets really thick. That's called acanthosis. The other thing is that the epidermis has a tendency to kind of push up and make these little fingers that are pushing up towards the surface. And these are called, this is papillomatous growth. And this can either be really prominent here, almost warty or verrucous looking, or it can be more subtle and kind of undulating. Every nevus sebaceus is a little bit different. And um, so that's one thing. The epidermis is usually acanthotic and it's often either papillomatous or verrucous looking. And sometimes it can look like a wart or like a seborrheic keratosis actually. Okay. The second thing that you'll usually see is really prominent sebaceous glands. And the sebaceous glands uh, tend to be larger and more prominent the older the patient is. So if they're um, in their teens or in adulthood after puberty, the sebaceous glands tend to be really large and well-developed. And they have a unique feature. Remember that sebaceous glands normally drain directly into hair follicles. And if, if you need a refresher on basic skin histology, you can look down in the comment section below and I'll put a link to my normal skin histology video and I'll uh, link it to the, uh, the, the part of the video where I talk about sebaceous glands so you can refresh your memory. Okay, sebaceous glands normally drain into a follicle, but here what they're doing is they're draining directly to the skin surface. They're just going straight up without any hair um, involvement. They're not hooked onto a hair follicle. And in fact, I just told you that these usually occur on the scalp, but what thing are we not seeing here? There's no hair. And that's actually one of the most useful diagnostic features from even from ultra low power Look at the side here. That's what normal scalp looks like. Let me turn the light down a little. These are large antigen phase hair follicles that go way down and their roots, here's a root over here. It's kind of cut at a funny angle. Remember, we're looking at a two dimensional slice of three dimensional skin here. So that's the root of a hair follicle. And that's the kind of the, uh, the part of the hair follicle that's going up further above the roots. And it's got an outer and inner root sheath. And then it empties up to the surface. And see here, look, this is normal. Normal sebaceous gland right here draining into the hair follicle. And look, here's a hair shaft in the middle of the follicle. See that brown pigmented thing? That's a hair shaft. So the shaft is the hair itself that will come out of the skin, the part that you get cut when you get a haircut. All of the epithelial structure surrounding it is the hair follicle. And the sebaceous gland normally drains into that follicle. But let's go back to lower power and look. The scalp normally has tons of hair, unless you're an older, bald person. Um, you know, older men a lot of times don't have very many follicles left on their scalp after some time of, uh, of uh, baldness, but that's a whole other video. But normally you have lots of big, thick hair follicles that are rooted down in the, sub the subcutaneous um, fat, the adipose tissue. And look, here we go, and then all of a sudden there's one more kind of curving hair follicle here, that's its root down there, and then they're gone. And look what we have here. We have dermis and subcutis. There's a bunch of sebaceous glands, the nevus sebaceous up top, but no more follicles down there. And then as you get back to the other edge of the lesion, look what happens. The nevus sebaceous goes away and the hair follicles come back. And so this is why these lesions are allopedic. They, are, they lack hair usually clinically. They look like a little bald patch on the head of, of the baby when they, when they present. Oops, that's the wrong, the wrong way. Okay. So that's really one great clue from low power is if you're thinking about nevus sebaceus, when they're real, real uh, robust, they look very obvious like this. But on some more subtle lesions, you might wonder, is this enough to be a nevus sebaceus? Well, look down below. Are the hair follicles gone and you're on the scalp of a child where there should be many hair follicles? That's an easy way to tell, yeah, you're probably dealing with a nevus sebaceus. So, okay, back to what we were saying. You have uh, papillomatous, acanthotic um, epithelial surface. The epidermis is thickened and kind of warty looking. And sometimes it looks like a seborrheic keratosis too. 
And then you usually have large sebaceous glands that drain directly out to the skin surface. You have a loss of normal hair follicles underneath most of the time. And there's one other feature that you sometimes have, if we're lucky. So these little, uh, little tubes here put together, these are normally eccrine glands, okay? Eccrine glands make this little coil that is down at the dermal subcutaneous junction. But look at these, if we look at the cytologic features, what these cells look like, they're actually much more pink than normal eccrine glands should be. And again, in the skin histology video, we go into this in detail. Oh, there, that's exactly what I'm looking for, right there. Can we get the light just right? And look even closer, the cytoplasm is kind of a, it's really hard to get the show up on this video. Let me see if I flip the condenser, if that will show. Yeah, sometimes when you flip the condenser, it'll show things that are refractile. You can kind of get the sense that the cytoplasm has a little bit of a graininess or granularity. It's real pink and it has lots of little tiny dots. It's much easier to see microscopically than it is here on this video. And the nuclei are very, are big and round. They're uniform. They just look just like their neighbors. And each one has a, a big dot-like nucleus in the center of the nucleus. These cytologic features, what these cells look like, are apocrine cells, not eccrine cells. So the, the structure of the gland looks kind of like the normal eccrine gland, but the cells themselves look like apocrine cells. So sometimes we call these uh, apoecrine glands or apocrine glands that are present oftentimes, if you're lucky, you'll see them in nevus sebaceus. And the, the reason that this is important is because apocrine glands don't normally belong on the scalp. Normally apocrine glands are limited to the axilla, the anogenital region. Sometimes you can see them around the, uh, the nipple and uh, around the, the eyelids, you can see them, the glands of mall. And there may be a couple of other places, but most other places on the body um, do not have apocrine glands normally. So when I see apocrine glands, um, present in the dermis, that's another clue that I might be dealing with a nevus sebaceus. So you may be wondering, what on earth is this lesion? That it has sebaceous glands, it has apocrine glands, it has this funny epidermal change, the hair is gone. These are probably hamartomatous processes. Anytime you see uh, normal structures like apocrine glands present in a site where they don't belong, you have to think about, is this a hamartoma or uh, some sort of ectopic process. So these are hamartomas. These are all normal skin structures. They're just all mingled together in an abnormal way at this site. So this kind of um, unusual organization of normal benign um, uh, skin structures is the clue to the diagnosis of, or is what nevus sebaceus represents etiologically, okay? So let's see over here. And again, beautiful epidermal uh, hyperplasia or acanthosis. You've got a uh, nice large sebaceous glands there, draining, direct, look, again, look at that perfect, it's draining directly up to the surface. And then down there, sometimes you'll see apocrine, um, uh, apocrine cells in the glands, in the sweat glands down below. So that's nevus sebaceus. And look, I think there's even a little bonus right here. Oh yeah. Right in the middle of this sebaceous gland, there's a little structure. So this is a mite, actually. It's a little, uh, this is an arthropod, a little organism. And this is a mite called uh, Demodex. And Demodex are really common mites, actually, that live on the skin surface, or not on the skin surface, that live in the, in the hair follicles and sebaceous glands of uh, humans. And they don't usually cause any problems. They don't invade your body. They just kind of hang out here. And what they're, they're hanging out here is for this, this fatty buffet of sebum, which is the secretion from the dying sebocytes as they come out. They make this kind of greasy, oily secretion, and the Demodex love to eat that. And that's the kind of oily stuff that helps keep your skin and your hair shaft um, oily and, um, and healthy. So that stuff right there is also really tasty to the Demodex, and so the little Demodex mites love to live in there. And they're pretty common. Uh, a lot of people have them. We see them multiple times every day in dermatopathology, and um, usually they don't cause any problems. So uh, if it creeps you out, don't worry. You're not alone. It creeps us out a little bit too, but it won't hurt you. Okay, so that is a nevus sebaceus. Let's look at a couple other examples. So here's a different case. And you can see again the epidermal hyperplasia, although as opposed to the last case, the surface of the skin is actually pretty much flat. It's not, it's not really that papillomatous or verrucous looking. It's kind of flat and you have these long reedy that are pushing down and kind of anastomosing with one another to give you this uh, complex pattern. And most notably, you can see these dilated open spaces, these kind of comedonal um, spaces and some little cysts that are filled with keratin. 
And this could give you the impression, actually, at first glance, of a seborrheic keratosis. And um, I've seen cases uh, that looked even more like a seborrheic keratosis than this on the surface. The clue here is that this is from a 16-year-old patient. So it's very unusual for a young patient of that age to get um, uh, seborrheic keratoses. So if you, um, I, I in my experience, most SEBs that I see in practice are, are patients usually 30 years old or older. That's not a hard and fast rule, but in general, if I see someone in there as a child or teenager or even early 20s that has something that looks like a seborrheic keratosis, I stop and think, could this be a nevus sebaceous that doesn't have a well-developed sebaceous gland component? Or alternatively, could it be what's called an epidermal nevus? An epidermal nevus is basically a hamartomas process that involves just the epidermis, so there'll be kind of a warty or acanthotic looking epidermis made of benign keratinocytes, but it won't have um, the adnexal component that a nevus sebaceous has. By this point, you might be wondering, well, I keep saying nevus, but where are the melanocytes? And that's because the word nevus, my understanding, is that it comes from the Latin, uh, the Latin root that means um, birthmark. And so a nevus is basically an, an old term for a birthmark. And now that we better understand what all these lesions are made of, we realize that most of the things that have been called nevus are melanocytic nevi. So a melanocytic nevus nowadays in modern usage, when we say nevus, usually what we mean is a melanocytic nevus or a mole, um, as it's called by non-medical people. And, um, but there are in dermatology still a handful of diseases that have the term nevus in them that are not melanocytic nevi. Nevus sebaceous is one, epidermal nevus is another, and there are a few others too that are kind of uh, usually, usually congenital uh, processes or, or um, lesions that occur in young kids that are uh, birthmarks basically, or, or kind of could be thought of as birthmarks, but that are not melanocytic nevi. So that's why nevus sebaceous is kind of uh, thought to be a misnomer by modern terms, but it's actually technically okay by uh, more ancient terms. So that's why there's no melanocytes in nevus. But this one, like I said, has an appearance on the surface that looks like a seb, but look, tons of huge, massive sebaceous glands. And these sebaceous glands are nice and mature. They're full of that uh, nice, pale, bubbly, lipidized cytoplasm. And they uh, are kind of dilated in the center. And what do they do? They drain straight out to the skin surface. You can't see the connection there because we're kind of cut out of the plane of section, but that's that's just draining straight out to the surface, okay? So again, and look, another Demodex in here. Actually a whole, like a whole family of them. It's like one, two, three, four. So like I told you, Demodex are common and they like to eat that sebaceous secretion. So here we have large sebaceous glands draining to the surface and we have a surface epidermal change that looks kind of like a seborrheic keratosis in this case. So again, it can be warty and papillomatous. It can be kind of flat and with a thick, long reedy that anastomose together and uh, kind of make horn pseudocysts and resemble a seborrheic keratosis. Um, sometimes the epidermis is not very remarkably changed in some nevus sebaceous, but you'll have the underlying adnexus abnormalities with the sebaceous glands and the apocrine looking sweat glands. So all of those things. And again, one thing that is notably absent here, there is very little in the way of hair follicles, even though we're on the scalp. Big, massive sebaceous glands, but no big hair follicles. So that should be your clue to, uh, to nevus sebaceous here. Now here's another example, and this one has um, more of a kind of warty, undulating, or papillomatous surface. And sometimes the surface really can resemble a uh, veruca, really can look uh, warty. And I kind of suspect and wonder if HPV is involved sometimes in some of the surface changes in these, uh, the human papillomavirus. I don't have proof of that. There may be actually papers about this. In fact, there probably are. Surely someone's thought of this before, but um, I've not uh, done a lot of reading on that. So that's a topic for me to have to read on. No matter how long you do pathology or dermatopathology, there's always new stuff to learn, and there's always more literature than you could read in a whole lifetime. So I learn new things every day. But again, you have the prominent sebaceous glands, not quite as massive as the last one. These look a little more immature. I wonder if this might be a younger patient. I don't remember um, what patient this came from, but you can see them again uh, connecting to the surface. And this one actually does have some little hairs. Look, see these little basaloid balls here? These are kind of like hair roots uh, but they're kind of small vellus hairs that have their roots up here in the dermis. 
rather than the big antigen uh, kind of mature hairs that I showed before that have their roots down in the subcutis. And see, look, again, there's none of those uh, deep hair follicles that we would normally see in the scalp. And right here we've got a coil of what look like eccrine glands at first glance, but looking closer, you can beautifully see that these are actually apocrine cells here. And again, like I told you, apocrine glands shouldn't be present on the scalp, and so not normally. So here the, uh, the and again, the apocrine glands have large round nuclei and uh, central kind of prominent nucleoli and the cytoplasm tends to contain kind of these let's see there you can see these kind of eosinophilic uh, refractile granules in the cytoplasm and then these uh, what we call apocrine snouts these little blebs of cytoplasm that stick into the lumen of the gland so those are apocrine cells and as you go up here look they start to look a little bit more like eccrine cells up here a little less prominent uh, nuclear changes, but they're still actually pretty big and round, the nuclei, which is one thing that I think is really helpful to tell if you're dealing with apocrine cells, uh, those large round nuclei that are very uniform, and the prominent nucleoli, those big, look like little eyeballs almost, or like uh, someone on Instagram once told me they look like minions, and I thought that they do, that's pretty good. And so now if you're watching this movie uh, 20 years in the future, I'll have probably dated myself badly by mentioning Instagram and minions, but that's okay. I'll be old by then, so I won't care. And uh, again, this is a nice example of just kind of the different patterns you can see in Nevis sebaceous, the prominent sebaceous glands here. And look, to see the surface here is, it's a little thickened and acanthotic and a little bit kind of undulating up and down, but really not dramatically different from normal, uh, like the first two cases I showed. So uh, this is a good example that there's kind of a lot of variety you can have in uh, Nevis sebaceous. All right. And here's another one. Look at, again, look at the edge. Oh, let's go to lower power. At the edge, you can see the normal epidermis and a big antigen hair follicle going down with its root way down in the subcutis. At the other edge, same thing. You can see normal epidermis and lots of hairs. This is kind of normal density of hair on the scalp. And then suddenly in the middle, alopecia, basically. Lost hair in the center of this process. Um, and this was a, from a young child. So again, the surface looks, you could argue it looks a little like a seborrheic keratosis, kind of acanthotic, thickened epidermis, and um, not very warty, but you look, you've got a little horn pseudocyst over here. But this is from a five-year-old child's scalp. So definitely five-year-old kids do not get seborrheic keratoses in my experience, all right? And um, so that's, that's the epidermal change. And again, you might wonder, well, where are the sebaceous glands? But look, they're in here. They're just really small. Let me see, I thought there was a better area on here. Ah, yeah, here we go. Look, we've got little tiny, tiny sebaceous glands, little baby ones that are draining, right? And it is, it's from a little, well, five-year-old's not a baby, but, but uh, you can see that uh, they're little tiny ones because kids before puberty oftentimes have a much smaller sebaceous glands that the, the sebacytes haven't really expanded and filled with lipid yet. And my understanding is that's because the hormonal changes of, that come with puberty and into adulthood, those hormones drive uh, the production of sebaceous secretion. And so um, these sebaceous glands look very small and kind of immature in kids. The cells don't look as big and as white because they're not loaded up with as much lipid, which washes out during processing. So you can see each of these little sebaceous lobules, they do have bubbly, vacuolated sebacytes. They're just much smaller glands overall and much less of that uh, lipid, that white space in them. So this is a nice example of what, um, and it's not, it doesn't always work this way, but I feel like it, it often does, that you see in kids, the sebaceous glands are a lot smaller in a nevus sebaceous. They're a lot less prominent and less dramatic. Um, see, look, even here you can see little tiny nubs of, of sebaceous lobule but they're so small, they're so much smaller than normal sebaceous glands in adults and so much smaller than those dramatically enlarged sebaceous glands I showed you in the other examples. So a good example of, um, of a nevus sebaceous from a, a child before puberty. And then the last thing I wanna to touch on here is that nevus sebaceous, um, because of, I, I don't exactly understand why, but I think it's because of all of the, the variety of, of uh, 
um, abnormally arranged um, adnexal uh, structures here, they have this tendency to give rise to a variety of different um, adnexal tumors and um, uh, most of them are benign. So you can see things like a syringocyst adenoma papilliferum and um, I have a video about that entity which I'll post a link down in the comments below. And then also you can see basaloid neoplasms which uh, historically there's been debate whether these represent true basal cell carcinomas. Let's see if we can find one. Here we go. This is a little basaloid looking uh, proliferation here. So some people would say in the past, well, these are basal cell carcinomas. And I think, and the literature goes back and forth, but my opinion and from what I've read on it, I think that most of these probably are benign hair follicle tumors like trichoblastoma or trichoepithelioma. And part of the reason for this is that oftentimes what you'll see around them, you do see blue basaloid. Oops, let's get this in. Uh, get the lighting right here. You do see blue basaloid cells and you see basal palisading around the outside, but you also see this nice cellular stroma and the cellular stroma is kind of clumping together here right next to and pushing into this basaloid nest. So that's a feature that it kind of is resembling what we call a papillary mesenchymal body, which is a feature usually seen in benign hair follicle tumors like trichoepithelioma and trichoblastoma. And that's a whole other co uh, complicated topic for another video. So this, uh, this little proliferations like this, uh, most of the time I think that these actually represent benign hair follicle proliferations and not truly basal cell carcinogenic carcinoma. See here's more of it over here. There's some more of those little immature sebaceous glands. Here's some more of this basaloid stuff that looks kind of like basal cell carcinoma but is probably trichoep or trichoblastoma. We've got some big massive sebaceous glands here. I mean, look at that one. It's like an upside down tree or something. It's huge and draining again directly to the surface of the skin. What else do we have here? Oh look this is a little a little fun finding. This is actually a piece, uh, the color is not going to show up quite right here, but this is actually a piece of bone. So this is uh, benign uh, metaplastic bone and we can see this in the skin of the face particularly, a metaplastic phenomenon. Some people suspect that it's due to like ruptured hair follicles and it's, it's just benign bone that's being formed as a, a type of metaplasia as a reactive process over time. So not of any significance, doesn't mean anything, just kind of a curiosity here. Again, look, like other nevus sebaceous like we've talked about, those are the, uh, the uh, apocrine glands that are present there oftentimes. And let's see what other secondary tumors we have growing here. Oh, look, and here, this is a nice example. If you watch my video on syringocyst adenoma papilliferum, you'll recognize this right away. Invaginated, kind of branching, cleft-like um, lumens that are connected to the surface of the skin. When you go closer, they're lined by a double layer of cuboidal to columnar cells right here, and then numerous plasma cells in the dermis and uh, kind of papillary structures like that are cut uh, tangentially and look like little islands floating in the middle of these spaces. So this is syringocyst adenoma papilliferum, a benign sweat gland tumor that most often I see it in the context of nevus sebaceus. So we had a syringocyst adenoma papilliferum, some little uh, trichoepithelioma or trichoblastoma, little tiny uh, components of that. And uh, this is a um, relatively common process. And I'll, sometimes I'll list out what the different components are. Sometimes I'll, if there's a bunch of different things, and especially if it's a, uh, a surgeon rather than a dermatologist removing this, I'll just say there's, there's a variety of benign adnexal uh, neoplasms that are growing in the background of the nevus sebaceous and, and um, no further treatments needed to make sure that I don't worry people with all these fancy terms like syringocyst adenoma papilliferum and all of that. Uh, here's another example of a nevus sebaceous. Sometimes you see things underneath that are dilated and cystic, like this, and that look, and they're lined by um, cuboidal cells. In this case, they've got little uh, apocrine snouts on them. So this looks very similar to an apocrine uh, hydrocystoma. And um, I'll put a link, I've got a, a little video that has some stuff about uh, hydrocystomas. I'll put a link down below for that too. So this, uh, this is basically like a little hydrocystoma arising here underneath this nevus sebaceous. More of those little basaloid um, hair follicle proliferations. And then we have this right over here. Now this actually is basaloid but it really is starting to look like a basal cell carcinoma. 
at least potentially. And so this case I thought actually might represent a true example of basal cell carcinoma. It's got nice, uh, nice clefting artifact around the outside of the nests. Um, and again, it's a small thing in the middle of this big excision. So is it of any significance to the patient? Probably not in this case. And, and this is one of the rare times that I've actually seen this and really thought, yeah, that could represent true basal cell carcinoma growing in a nevus sebaceus. But most of the basaloid proliferations I've seen in nevus sebaceus are uh, benign hair follicle proliferations in my opinion. So this one I felt probably did, and my colleagues felt as well, that this probably represented a true basal cell carcinoma. I'm, if you want to argue about that, you're welcome to leave a comment down below because I'm sure other people might disagree. Um, and uh, I have I have rarely seen um, uh, a more aggressive malignancies arise in nevus sebaceus. I saw one apocrine carcinoma once, and I don't have that slide handy to show you, but it was an apocrine carcinoma and uh, definitely malignant, and it was growing in the background of a nevus sebaceus. It was in an adult, and it kind of had grown quickly in a patient with a long-standing nevus sebaceus. And there have been a few cases in the literature reported, uh, particularly of apocrine carcinoma arising in nevus sebaceus and actually having an aggressive course and a, and a bad outcome. So so it's extremely rare to have uh, an aggressive um, adnexal malignancy grow in the background of nevus sebaceus, but it can potentially happen. So just so you're aware of that, but I, I uh, think that the majority of the things I see in nevus sebaceus are benign. So that's the nevus sebaceus video, and I hope that you found that useful in better understanding this uh, interesting entity.